So I'm going to try and give an overview of the complexity of the situation that we find ourselves in with the current referendum coming up in uh, October 2013. Now, I think the first problem that I have with what's going on right now is the fact that it's against our law as Indigenous people to be able to speak on behalf of other people's countries. There are over 500 different countries in this uh, landmass called Australia now, and we've always uh, known that we can't speak on behalf of anybody else's country. The, the laws are in place so that we can protect our own countries, protect our own sacred sites. We know them more intimately than anybody else. And so, you know, like a singular voice uh, that has uh, limited representation, where the process of the representation that built the councils for the voice to start with was limited to corporations, was limited to um, a selected group of individuals that were uh, handpicked and not representative of grassroots community at all. Well, the, the process since then has been railroaded to continue to be a handpicked group of corporate blackfellas that, um, you know, they've, they've put it in a few regional centres, they've done what they call world's best practice, but, you know, like, <laughs> it's hardly world's best practice to be able to continue to, like, you know, handpick a few people that, that can't even speak out against the, uh, the agenda if they are government employees, you know, like, you, you, you're going to find that the people who are sellouts to be able to sign off on the, the different government agreements and things that this is clearly about. You know, that's number one. That's, it's just very basic that it's against our law. Now, the next thing that I have is that, you know, the, we've, we've got a referendum coming up where 97% of the population are non-Indigenous Australians, not that even we are Indigenous Australians. You know, words, terminologies that can tangle, tangle you all up and, and get the wrong meaning across because we've got to use words to be able to explain things. Now, we're not Indigenous Australians, for example. We are, I am more a worry person, and every other mob has their own language name for who they are. And so, you know, like, that's not one group. That's different countries. My great-grandmother spoke eight languages, all of our neighbouring tribes, before she spoke English. Murawari, Nyimba, Barkindji, Uwaliai, you know, like, she just be able to speak all of our neighbouring languages. How else were we going to be able to communicate with another country if we didn't know their language? Like, we don't know all of their sacred sites. We don't know all of their things. We don't even know that because it's not our country, so how is 97% of the country supposed to know anything about Indigenous Australia? Those words again, Indigenous Australia. How are you supposed to know? How are you supposed to know about our law? How are you supposed to know about your law? How are we supposed to know what the government is going to do with the laws that they're purporting when the question itself isn't the law that they're going to change, that's also against their own constitutional law. But 97% of the country is supposed to vote on a question, are we supposed to, are we going to recognise an Indigenous Australian voice to Parliament? Well, that's pretty easy, yeah, that's a no-brainer. Of course, it's a sentimental feel-good question, of course, but what does it mean? That the government is going to have all of the powers to control the function, the design, the, the, uh, the funding, everything. They're going to have complete control over how it all works and who's involved. And then that voice has no power. No funding to do anything. They can just talk to the government as a singular voice that's un underrepresented, that can't speak for country, all of the different countries, 
and then that it has no power to veto if the government doesn't agree. Now, what sort of a voice is that if all you can do is give a few recommendations that can be rejected with no power to do anything about it? That is the most diluted, weakest version of an Indigenous voice that I've ever heard. It's, it's disgusting. Now, we have the right to self-determination. When I say we, firstly, I mean all of the different mobs. But secondly, I mean all of humanity. But the process of decolonization can't happen if we try and use a colonized process. The process of breaking down all of the dysfunction won't be done through using a dysfunctional system. The voices that have been represented to Parliament have never been listened to. Now, why do you think we've got an Aboriginal tent embassy sitting outside on Parliament lawn over 40 years? Has that voice been listened to? Well, no. In fact, quite the opposite. It's continuously raided by federal police. It's tried to be burned, shut down, closed the entire time. The entire time, mobs have been gathering there from all over the country, self-representing, putting their voices to the government right there on their lawns. They didn't even have to go far to listen to voices. Have they gone and sat down and listened? Are they listening to grassroots voices that are coming out right now? All over the country, people are making videos and trying to educate the Australian public because they're not listening. It's not that there isn't a voice to Parliament. There's this like 13 or 14 politicians right now that have got Indigenous heritage. They're all talking to the government They've all got different voices and it's supposed to be that way. You want a unified voice, but you don't have a unified voice in your own parliament. You've got all these different factions talking about all these different things because everyone's got different needs and society is vast and different. The within different indifference, the within difference in our culture is as vast as the between difference between our cultures. How are we supposed to like represent all of the diversity of our mob in a singular voice to parliament? And then how are Australians supposed to know what our wishes are when they're being put to a vote next month when we can't even get a, a singular voice together ourselves because neither can you. And no one can. And we're not supposed to. You know, having, having a convenient singular voice that they can sign off on and saying, well, we've heard the recommendations of the Indigenous people. The voice has told us. We don't agree with it. Now we're getting, we've done the consultation. Let's move along. And they can sign off all the agreements that they like with whichever agendas that they have. And we continue on in this dysfunctional system, which is destroying our planet. So I don't know how you're supposed to vote on that if you're, a, you know, a mainstream Australian that is, is totally lost, lost in dark, murky waters where you've got no idea what to say yes or no to. Obviously people who don't want to feel like they're being racist, want to say yes to this. But what happens if you're being led down a path that ends up being more racist without your knowing? You know, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. And people got to start listening, actually listening.
it's too easy just to marginalize our people once again because you know like we've had generations of it everyone here in australia has been conditioned to think that we are a dysfunctional people drunks thieves you know degenerates all of your when i say your i'm talking about the western mindset in education policy systems everything that's unexamined within the the psyche of the western mind which is all of your worst traits they get put onto us we get demonized and marginalized and this is how racism works you know? all of your worst traits get put onto the other and then they can be that and especially you know like if there's some sort of other agenda like to hide all of the guilt and the shame of stealing their land Yeah, this is the third thing, right? Can sovereignty be ceded through this process? Now, the yes campaigners are all talking about, no, it can't be ceded. Now, there are other people on the no campaign that are saying, well, this is the gateway to help try and cede our sovereignty. People are afraid of that. Now, my personal opinion on all this is that, you know, you can't have an illegal constitution that is set up on false paperwork such as terra nullius and form a constitution based on a lie and then have a bunch of foreign nationals basically vote on whether Murawari people and all of the other countries around this great continent should be a part of their illegal constitution. It's like an illegal vote and an illegal constitution doesn't cede our sovereignty. It's still just more smoke and mirrors. I'm sure it'll make it more difficult to continue to get the word out there if there is a voice to parliament that they're all signing stuff off on now. You know, just like the land councils do. It's more difficult now with land titles and all of that sort of native title and the land councils for grassroots elders to be able to have a say because the government's already got somebody to sign off on that country on their behalf that's working within their corporate agenda. And so the other voices get squashed. Now this is what, this is the same model that they use all of the time. It's like find somebody to sign off. All you have to do is find one black fella to sign off or a small group of black fellas to sign off. And then the rest of them don't get a say. It's so hard. It's so complex because we get labeled as if we're doing one thing which we're, we're like you know all of the degenerate things and then we get then other people that are then put in positions of power our, our own mob that sell out our own culture and then and then we're getting told that it's the good thing to do So that we can like combat racism and stuff we're actually like leading ourselves down a pathway which just supports capitalism more it doesn't support our culture it just supports the status quo this is way too complex to be able to just deal with it in, in even a single conversation Every time I start going down a path, it leads into more complexity and it's hard to explain one thing when it leads into so many other things. It's like, how do we explain 
the importance of honouring all of the different voices of our mobs and in our individuality, in our separateness. And then how do we explain the importance of that coming together as a collective whole on a grassroots level to be able to get the voices out there that will truly help us care for country? But when we're distracted by all of these other campaigns like the Yes campaign right now, to be able to even get to the conversations that we want to be able to get to. Now, you know, if you want to do something, vote no to start with, because at least we've got the goalposts where we know where they are at the moment. You know? The more organised we get, the more they try and shift the, the goalposts around. And as soon as you get close to nailing something, or, or it even has been, you know, like, there's been such progressions in the sovereignty movement that I feel like the government is really scared, which is why they need to push it forward so hard right now to try and silence the, the actual movement that's going on. Anyway, <clears throat> it's such a long dialogue. I'm going to have to keep on coming back to it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting. Keep on like tuning in and I'll keep on trying to give up more updates.